The Winter Haven Amtrak station is one of the last in Florida that retains its 20th century aesthetic. Built in 1925 by the Seaboard Airline, it was to provide a charming rail fan location on this sunny Monday morning. First patron was CSX train I-177. One seven seven is an overnight container run from Jacksonville to Winter Haven, whose intermodal logistics facility is about six miles south of the station. Catching the train in daylight was possible today due to an unscheduled departure from Savannah, probably as a result of the constantly fluctuating supply chain environment. This morning's Savannah version of I-177 was massive with a 2 by one power configuration of Jeevos hauling 316 containers spread out over 166 platforms. The beast of an intermodal is slamming over CSX's junction with the Florida Midland, a regional rail-owned short line operating a six-mile branch line southwest of the station. The Winter Haven Amtrak station was a rendezvous point for my friend and I, as we both intended to chase the FMID, whose power is stationed at the south end of the line in Bartow. While CF7 number 50 was on scene, GP7U number 57 would be doing the dirty work this morning. A little bit of Santa Fe still shines through on the 57, with the trademark silver trucks and blue bonnet fuel tank. The little engine was soon fired up, departing staging at the Bartow Airport. Apparently, the Florida Midland didn't have any outbounds today, which meant the crew had a straight shot engine light for the CSX interchange at the Winter Haven station. Did someone say tree tunnel? I felt like I was back on the Reading and Northern for a second as the scrappy old blue bonnet ambled up the right of way on the railroad's Gordonsville branch. Contrary to most of my short line excursions, I was running with a fellow rail fan today. My buddy Max is a local in these parts and was putting me on to some neat spots along the six mile branch line. The Florida Midland has two GP7Us and this is the first occasion I've been lucky enough to get one in action as it scoots by an old transload facility. Closing in on the main line metal, we decided to go for a stroll along 7th Street. This led us to an old seaboard bridge, soon occupied by the light engine. jump, skip, and a hop up the street, and we were back on scene at Amtrak as the crew reversed off their property and on to CSX. With the switch now lined for the main line, the GP7U would head south to the interchange track where its inbounds are waiting. The crew was quite efficient and can be seen returning to home rails about half an hour later with eight loads. Max is a frequent photographer of the FMID and noted how this is the largest cut of inbounds he had seen to date.
Once train Z903 was lined back for home rails, its two rail fans had located back to the bridge. The scenic little hideout is made possible by an unnamed canal connecting two nearby lakes which also happens to cut under CSX. The short line kept us waiting for a decent amount of time for reasons beyond our knowledge, but good things come to those who wait and the eight car train was soon nosing over the water. The Florida Midland crew was well acquainted with me and Max by now, even giving us a little horn show as they slowly but surely closed in. For whatever reason, I love how this scene turned out. Even with the dead grass, there's something about a short line through a field that I can't quite get enough of. From the field, we bid adieu to the Florida Midland as they were preparing to switch a transload facility and our interest had been piqued by CSX. Yes, you heard that correctly, I was ditching a short line for the venerable Class 1. From the Gordonsville branch, I followed Max deep into CSX's Bone Valley, a fascinating web of tracks that allow for shuttle service to and from the region's phosphate mines. I absolutely love rail fanning the BV, as you don't often find a network of class 1 trackage like this made up entirely of shuttle trains. Much of these shuttles are based out of Mulberry, one of the focal points of the BV network. It's a complicated navigational task to the untrained, although my tour guide is anything but. As we pulled into Mulberry Yard, the first thing I noticed was this massive crew bus, but that's not what we were here for. The action lied just ahead, as a departing set of YN2GEs on train K341 would provide our next chase. I guess we found out pretty quickly what that crew bus was for. A slew of on-track equipment was unloading, but our interests remained with K341. Nothing a quick U-turn can't fix, and the chase was on. CSX 9025 is part of a 40 pack of C40-9Ws on the roster and one of only 10 or so in active duty. Paired with a matching AC4400CW and running shuttle service in the Bone Valley, Max and I just had to give chase. The set of light engines was heading for Mosaic's New Wales facility south of Mulberry, one of the largest phosphate processing plants in the world. We happened upon the GEs again, just south of Mulberry, doing no less than their 40 mile an hour track speed. With K341 
C341's quick pace, it was a decent task to get ahead of the train, but we had lit down on the fields of Edison Junction with just enough time. The YN2 paint scheme used to be all too common on CSX, however the boxcar logo's onslaught has changed that for the worse. What was once something most wouldn't bother to photograph, the hockey stick scheme provided a good looking pair of GEs as they rolled through Edison. Much like the Florida Midland through the field of dead grass, I think our pair of six axles looks really sharp as they work their way towards Mosaic. New Wales is just around the corner, so this is the last place we were to see K341, at least before they picked up their train. Shortly after the light power arrived at Mosaic, the facility spat out a different train altogether. We were scouting spots when this happened and had to quickly backtrack, as evidenced by our below par shot of train 0730. Max was not happy. Our proximity to Mulberry Yard combined with the train's length almost guaranteed we wouldn't see this train again. Thankfully the shuttle run slowed to a crawl in order to swing into the yard, giving us a glimmer of hope to leapfrog the train. I took the opportunity to get my first side-by-side -side shot with my new car, although I can't act like this didn't make me miss the Jeep. O730 has now entered Mulberry yard limits. After hours of chasing trains with little time to spare, we figured a breath of relief was in store. It wasn't, as K341 announced their departure from Mosaic for points south, while the two of us were happily watching O730 at the north end of the valley. We weren't about to let 9025 squirm away and made a barely legal sprint down to Bradley Junction. Bradley is where a plethora of tracks converge, with our train coming off the west side out of New Wales and taking a swing south bound for Agrock. Having now assembled a train of wet rock phosphate, K341 would lead us through the southern reaches of the Bone Valley. The Bone Valley is an eerie region of Florida, with wide open fields dotted with phosphate mines and branch lines. There's really nothing quite like it, and it feels otherworldly until you realize that two bright future GEs are clawing their way towards you.
This is the curve. Max and I were dead set on getting 341 here, even if it was with little time to spare. The elevated angle of the train through some nice winter sunlight worked out great, not to mention the awesome pace shot we were treated to afterwards. This is along Fort Green Road, a couple miles north of Agrock. Agrock is where CSX will hand the train over to Mosaic, whose private railroad will take the wet rock another eight miles to their massive Four Corners mine. Four Corners will turn the wet rock into some sort of finished product. I think most of the facilities down here make fertilizer. From there, it's really anyone's guess. The final product may be destined for overseas out of Tampa's Rockport Terminal or put on those infamous unit trains to Chicago. It didn't matter much to us anymore though as our chase of K341 had concluded, at which point we turned right back around and beelined 25 miles directly north to the A-Line in Winston. This was done in order to get a glimpse of southbound X603, an extra section of Q603 made up entirely of loaded rock hoppers. We made it with about 50 seconds. Knowing X603 was bound for Winston Yard, the two of us made way for the Winston Y and were treated to some awesome golden hour lighting. I know I said that this train is an extra section of Q603, and yes, I also know that Q trains no longer exist on CSX. They did back when I shot this though, but funnily enough, we didn't see any Q trains all day. That was a hard thing to do on CSX. We'd seen I, K, O, X, and Z series trains, but not a single Q. We were gonna keep it that way, finishing off the day with PO92 ripping through town on its way into Tampa. Thanks for rail fanning with me today. I hope you enjoyed this action-packed day in the Bone Valley as much as I did.